in this segment, uh, we will take uh, everything we have learned so far and, and apply them to a practical system. Uh, our subject is uh, thermoelectric energy harvesting or the science of generating electricity uh, from heat. Let's begin with this um, rectangular block of a semiconductor. When we start our experiment, this, this block is, is sitting at um, a uniform temperature. So the two ends um, uh, of this block are exactly at the same temperature. So that's what we're showing here. T1 uh, is equal to uh, T2. Okay? And the electrons are um, uniformly distributed. And now we disturb this uh, imbalance by uh, providing heat uh, from the left side of this block. So this results in a temperature differential. Now, uh, on the uh, left, I have a higher temperature, T1, and on the right, I have a lower temperature, T2. So any semiconductor will do this. Um, when you have a temperature differential, temperature imbalance like this, a voltage can be measured between the two ends um, of the semiconductor. That voltage is delta V here, and it is directly proportional to the temperature differential, which is simply uh, T1 minus um, uh, T2. And the proportionality constant is S, and S is a property of the material, and it's called the Seebeck coefficient. In a semiconductor, uh, Seebeck coefficient is determined by uh, a number of things, uh, such as the band structure and also the doping density in the material. All right, so um, let's look at a practical uh, device. So imagine um, you have uh, taken this uh, semiconductor material and sandwiched uh, the material between two uh, hot uh, two conducting um, uh, plates. So the green plates are uh, those uh, plates that I'm uh, referring to. And suppose you have a heat source. So one of these plates um, gets hot. And so when uh, you provide heat uh, from the bottom, what happens is you have heat flowing through the uh, material. And, and the cold side, this top plate, is essentially uh, in contact uh, with the ambient. So we have air molecules on this side in random motion, which are physically interacting with the atoms of the uh, top plate. Therefore, the transfer uh, of energy uh, can take place physically uh, between the um, uh, atoms of the top plate and, and the ambient uh, molecules. So that way, uh, the heat uh, is rejected uh, from, from the top, and we have a continuous flow of heat from the hot side to the cold side. Okay? And, and that way, uh, assuming that I, I, I can reject the heat from the cold side, effectively such that uh, this delta T is uh, maintained. In other words, um, the, the device does not reach thermal equilibrium. Then um, there will be a voltage uh, difference uh, between the top plate and the bottom plate. Now, for semiconductors, a typical, um, for typical semiconductors, the Seebeck coefficient is in the 50 to 300 microvolt per um, degree Celsius range. Actually, uh, even though it's given as microvolt per degree cel uh, Celsius, microvolt per degree Kelvin, or Kelvin is, is much more commonly uh, used. So the single piece of um, semiconductor is going to generate uh, this much voltage, voltage and you can um, I think agree uh, with me that this this voltage is not uh, a very large voltage. It's just you know microvolts. Okay, you can't do a whole lot uh, with this voltage. But it is it is interesting to note that um, in our equation, um, the generated voltage 
is proportional to just the temperature differential. So the dimensions of the semiconductor, they're not in the picture. So it's independent of that. We have the delta V, the temperature the voltage differential is equal to delta T temperature differential times the Seebeck coefficient. All right. So actually, this uh, piece of uh, semiconductor can be uh, quite small. So it can be uh, a tiny semiconductor like this. And actually, if I do that, it will have the same um, Seebeck voltage um, generated. So to increase the voltage, one, one thought might be to uh, combine uh, a number of legs uh, like this. So um, imagine that um, we cut that um, long uh, piece of semiconductor into uh, many smaller legs and, and we connect them electrically in series using these uh, green uh, conductors. Okay, so simply um, the, the green lines show the electrical connections uh, between, between the legs. And, and imagine that I, um, I have this top plate, just like before, and, and I have a hot plate, just like before. Okay, so now I have sandwiched many legs between them, and now I'm able to generate essentially the same um, uh, Seebeck voltage uh, in each leg. And, and because they are uh, electrically connected in series, my hope is that I can add up uh, the voltages. Well, unfortunately, in this connect, uh, uh, connection that uh, we're looking at, that is not going to happen. If you go um, along this um, um, connection from one device, if you follow this uh, path, you can see that even though it seems like every single leg is generating a voltage, those voltages are canceling each other. So as a result, I'm not generating anything. So delta, uh, the, the summation of all those voltages actually give me nothing. It, it's zero. So I have to be doing something a little more intelligent than this. Uh, but there's a hint here. Uh, there's some, 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 some nice hint that uh, I can use smaller legs. I can, instead of a large chunk of semiconductor, I can divide it into smaller, smaller pieces. Okay, so is there anything that I can do, a trick, that will allow me to use the fact that I can use smaller legs and, and, and still connect them in series, like, like shown here, and get a larger voltage? So that um, takes us to uh, uh, semiconductor uh, materials doped with either electrons or holes. So uh, N-type or P-type uh, materials. So in an N-type material, as you know, uh, the majority carriers are electrons. Uh, we have um, an electron concentration uh, much larger uh, than the hole concentration, and the electron concentration is determined by the concentration of donor impurities. So N electron concentration is approximately equal to the donor concentration. Uh, for instance, in, uh, in silicon, uh, the donor atoms can be arsenic. Uh, in a group material, the arsenic uh, is the group 5. Um, now, if you, if you look at a P-type uh, material, the opposite is true. We have uh, holes as the ma majority carriers, and in this case, uh, we are doping uh, the material with a P-type impurity. For instance, for silicon, uh, boron, uh, a group three element, is a P-type impurity. And in this case, the hole concentration is approximately equal to um, the concentration of the acceptor uh, impurities. And I use, I use uh, approximately equal to uh, only because um, not all of those uh, donor and acceptor uh, atoms um, uh, have to be ionized. But in practice, at room temperature, if you have um, a reasonable semiconductor, that semiconductor will have practically all of the donor and acceptor atoms ionized. So indeed, electron and hole concentrations will be equal to donor and acceptor uh, impurity concentrations. 
just a quick review um, of n type and, and p type here. All right. So, um, so uh, in, in this uh, example, I have this n type and p type uh, semiconductor um, sitting uh, next to each other. So now I take these two and sandwich them between two uh, plates. And uh, I, uh, again, will say that one plate is hot, the other is cold. And that's happening again because I have a heat source. I have a heat source providing heat from the bottom and, and the heat is rejected uh, from the top. Okay, so there's continuous flow of heat through uh, both legs and, and because I'm able to reject the heat um, uh, efficiently, this device uh, does not reach uh, the thermal equilibrium. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is that delta T between the two ends is maintained. Because thermal equilibrium means uh, everything is at the same uh, temperature. And, and this is going to happen if I cannot reject the heat um, effectively uh, from the top side. Um, basically, I'm dumping he heat from the bottom uh, continuously, and if I can't reject the heat from the top, what's going to happen? Well, eventually, the top plate will get hot, and, and this delta T will disappear. So, in order to uh, have a delta T, I must make sure that my path is open for heat rejection, and, and my heat can be continuously flow uh, from the top plate uh, to the ambient. So let's assume that this is the case. Well, if that's the case, then I do have a delta T. Well, if I have a delta T, then these are semiconductors. We should have Seebeck voltages generated by both of them. Well, the interesting thing is that one is an n-type semiconductor, the other is a p-type semiconductor. All right. So um, now, um, with heat, with this delta T, uh, we have the electrons, which were uniformly distributed, actually moving to the top. And in this case, I have the holes moving to the top. Interesting. If that's happening, then I'm going to have a potential difference between the two ends of these semiconductor pieces. Now, the top of this n-type material is becoming more uh, negative, and, and the top uh, junction of this p-type material is becoming more positive. So, I am essentially creating um, a charge imbalance, and a charge imbalance is, is voltage. So, uh, here, here we go. So, um, if you look at the n-type material, the bottom of that um, leg, um, I'll call it the leg uh, for the lack of a better term, um, or piece of semiconductor is more positive. Well, opposite is true for the p-type semiconductor. The top is more positive because we have all the positively charged holes uh, on top. So now the polarity of the Seebeck voltage, therefore, is different for n-type and p-type materials. Now, this is interesting because if I use a conductive uh, wire and, and connect the two in series, well, I can add up these voltages, right? So I have, um, if I, when I go from this point to this point, I have a voltage drop because I'm going from positive to negative. So that's a voltage drop. And, and I go through my conductor. It's an ideal conductor, so there is no voltage drop there. And then if I go through the p-type material, I'm going through a positive voltage to negative voltage, so it's another voltage drop. So moving in this direction, I'm experiencing two voltage drops, um, one after another. So they are adding up. I have two voltage drops, so the potential here is less than the potential here. So I'm able to add these um, Seebeck voltages uh, generated. All right, so this is great. Uh, using um, uh, two n-type um, semiconductors, 
one n type the other p type i am now able to add uh, the the seebeck voltages generated uh, in these in these legs so if i put a voltmeter i can actually measure the voltage generated by this device so i do have a voltage generator converting this um, delta t to a voltage again what i'm doing really is taking the heat which is flowing uh, through this uh, material uh, flowing through this device rather and converting that uh, to, to a voltage but the fact is i'm not limited to just two legs why not use more legs okay now if i use more legs well i have lots of seebeck voltages generated like in this example here so i can i can uh use alternating um, p type and n type uh pieces i'll call these legs because that's the common terminology uh used in uh, thermoelectric devices so by adding these up in series I can have a much larger uh, voltage okay and again I'm assuming I'm assuming that once I connect these I still have a bottom plate which keeps all of these thermoelectric legs or semiconductor legs together so it serves as a substrate a mechanical support uh, for the legs and and these electrical contacts so i can't talk about the delta t between the two plates so now i have multiple legs between the two uh, between the two uh, plates all right so this is a thermoelectric generator now uh, there are a few things that we need to uh, consider one of them is that uh, just like any voltage generator this generator will have an internal resistance and the internal resistance we can refer to that as the parasitic resistance um, or the source resistance in this uh, circuit it's shown as r sub s okay so this is actually not a great thing to have because that's going to affect the performance um, of this device and here is why um the in the dashed uh, square right here i have an electrical model uh, for this thermoelectric device v sub oc stand for the open circuit voltage so this is essentially the voltage generated by the thermoelectric device measured by a voltmeter without an external load so by the external load i mean um whatever device that you are trying to power okay it may it may be a light bulb for instance that you are trying to uh, light up using this uh, thermoelectric device so that's the load okay the so in this case the open circuit when we measure the open circuit voltage nothing is connected we just connect a voltmeter between the two ends of the circuit and just measure the voltage between the two ends that's the open circuit voltage the resistance r sub s is nothing but the total resistance of the thermoelectric legs so what is that resistance well these rectangular legs are actually resistors they have some resistivity some length some cross-sectional area and i can calculate the electrical resistance of each leg by using my standard formula electrical resistivity times length divided by cross-sectional area so i can calculate the resistance of each leg and because these legs are electrically in series my resistance is essentially uh, the sum of all those resistances okay so let's look at our first equation the first equation basically says that the open circuit voltage is equal to um, voltage produced by each leg times the number of legs that is n okay there are a few assumptions here the first assumption is that the voltage produced by each leg is exactly the same well 
I am making that assumption because otherwise um, I would have to calculate the voltage produced by the p-type legs and n-type legs and add them up. And we are making the assumption for simplicity that those voltages are equal. And implicitly what I'm saying is that, well, the Seebeck coefficients of p-type and n-type legs uh, are equal, which does not have to be the case. Uh, these are different uh, materials. Um, they have uh, different structures, uh, different doping densities. Therefore, it's uh, perfectly okay to have these p-type and n-type legs with different Seebeck coefficients. But here, let's, for simplicity, assume that that's not the case. Both p-type and n-type legs have exactly the same Seebeck coefficient. So if that's the case, then since they all have the same delta t, um, we can just simply uh, calculate um, a voltage per leg and multiply that by the number of legs, which basically includes all p-type and n-type legs. That gives us an open circuit voltage V. Similarly, because all of these legs are in electrically in series, the total resistance, Rs, can be calculated by uh, calculating the resistance of a single leg and multiplying that by the number of legs n. And again, the assumption here is that the n-type legs and p-type legs have the same electrical resistance, which does not have to be uh, true. Um, again, um, we, we know very well that the doping density determines the resistance, and therefore, well, uh, in that case, uh, why should they have the same um, uh, resistivity. Again, this is a simplification. Just for the sake of the simple example, we are assuming that they are the same. Now, um, there is a theorem um, in electrical engineering. It's called the maximum power uh, transfer uh, theorem. And, and, and according to that theorem, if you calculate the power dissipated on the load, and if you want to maximize that power, what you need to do is uh, choose your load resistance such that it matches the source resistance. Okay. Now this is uh, important because um, with this thermoelectric device, uh, we will be powering uh, something. Um, uh, we said uh, in our previous um, um, example, light bulb, but it doesn't have to be a light bulb. It can be an electronic circuit or anything that does something, right? And, and it will have a resistance. So the goal is to have a matched um, uh, resistance. So if, if we have um, Rs equal to uh, the load resistance, these two equal resistances will actually result in voltage division such that the, uh, let me erase some of these, the voltage here is going to be equal to actually half the open circuit voltage if Rs is equal to the load resistance. These two resistors will share um, the uh, voltage equally. The other half is going to drop across this resistance. Okay, But even though this voltage division occurs, if our goal is to maximize uh, the power um, delivered to the load, uh, this is the best uh, condition. And, and you can verify this um, yourself. All you have to do is uh, write the equation for uh, the power um, um, dissipated on this load and take the derivative uh, with respect to uh, the resistance and equate that to zero to find uh, the optimal um, <coughs> uh, resistance <clears throat> that will give you uh, the maximum uh, power uh, transfer. So we have to match. And uh, of course, uh, we, we cannot control the, um, the, uh, the source resistance, but we can uh, optimize the load resistance uh, for a given um, source uh, resistance. Okay, so a, a, a real thermoelectric device uh, looks uh, like this. Um, just like we've talked about, we have a whole bunch of p-type and n-type um, legs, and, and these are uh, connected in series using these uh, metal connectors. Of course, you uh, have another set of metal connectors at the bottom uh, plate. And so you have this um, uh, plate, 
and and ideally you want this material to be uh, electrically insulating because you have all these metal contacts um, uh, touching it you don't want them to short but at the same time you want this material to to conduct heat well because it'll be communicating either with the hot side or the cold side or the heat source or the heat sink <coughs> so that the heat is uh, able to flow uh, through that device effectively and and here is uh, an actual um, uh, thermoelectric device um, as you can see um, this uh, plate let's try to enlarge this now you can see actually the conductor very nicely here the thermoelectric legs p-type and n-type uh, are seen and and you can also see the solder which is used to connect um, the, the the legs um, to um, um, the um, metal uh, conductors now the top material and the bottom material as we said must be electrically insulating but um, thermally conducting typically a ceramic is used for this uh, such as aluminum nitride uh, an insulator, an electrical insulator, but a great uh, thermal conductor uh, will do the job. Okay, so what are the material needs um, to construct a good uh, thermoelectric device? Well, this is tied to a very important uh, number, uh, figure of merit, uh, commonly used uh, to refer to uh, the quality of thermoelectric materials. The figure of merit uh, includes three properties of the semiconductor material. These are uh, the Seebeck coefficient, and in a good uh, for a good thermal uh, thermoelectric material, uh, the Seebeck coefficient must be as high as possible. So th this this makes sense because I'm essentially uh, trying to uh, generate the uh, the largest uh, voltage that I can generate for a given temperature differential. And, and Seebeck coefficient is my uh, proportionality constant. So larger that uh, coefficient, uh, larger the voltage I will have uh, for any uh, delta T. So I want this high Seebeck uh, coefficient. So I, am, I, I will seek semiconducting uh, materials that satisfy this first criterion. Second, I want uh, materials with low thermal conductivity. Why is that? Well, it is, it, is, um, it is so because I'm trying to maintain uh, a temperature differential between the hot plate and the cold plate, all right? Now, this is, this is a key um, um, property of, of this material. So I have all these legs that are electrically uh, in series. But in reality, um, as we uh, discussed before, all of these legs, every one of them, they are actually um, uh, heat uh, uh, leakage paths uh, for, for the heat flow. So heat is flowing through every single one of them. And therefore, uh, it is actually uh, getting more and more difficult to maintain this delta T because I'm making um, uh, the thermal resistance overall thermal resistance uh, of the uh, uh, between the two plates smaller and smaller as I add more legs because while they are electrically in series they are thermally in parallel so these parallel legs these these legs are actually working together to pass heat from the hot side to the cold side so larger the number of legs um, smaller the resistance I will have between the two plates, well, and, and smaller that resistance, more challenging it will be for me to keep that temperature differential um, uh, stay the same. So, therefore, I need materials with low thermal conductivity, okay? Finally, I want materials with high electrical conductivity, and that has to do with the source resistance. So, we've talked about that voltage division, uh, taking place between the source resistance of the generator and the load resistance. And, and, and to minimize that, I would like to have a source resistance as small as possible. 
So I want materials that, that conduct heat, uh, to conduct electricity uh, well. I want high electrical conductivity. So these three parameters are um, included in this ZT figure of merit. This is electrical conductivity, square of the Seebeck coefficient, and in the denominator we have the thermal conductivity of the material. Now this is multiplied by the ambient temperature T, okay? Because this is um, this is uh, the temperature at which this material is operating at, and that is part of my ZT figure of merit. All right, so just to give you an idea, um, if you have a ZT of 1, um, it is a fairly good number. In fact, if you look at most commercial uh, thermoelectric um, uh, devices, their ZT is on the order of 0.7 to 0.8. If you have a ZT of 1.5, it's an excellent ZT. If you have something greater than 2, that's a breakthrough. And there are scientists who um, devote their lives to increase this um, ZT figure of merit. Okay, so this is an ongoing uh, materials research. Uh, there are many, many scientists all around the world trying to improve the ZT figure of merit of these uh, materials. Improving the ZT is where nanotechnology um, comes to help. So before uh, we talk about how nanotechnology helps this, let's look at this figure of merit plot, which basically shows the ZT figure of merit of, of a variety of materials as a function of ambient temperature. And, and this is a very large temperature range uh, going from 0 to uh, 1,000 degrees uh, Celsius, a very large temperature. So you may be wondering uh, what application uh, we may have uh, at those temperatures. Well, if you look at um, the, um, uh, for instance, the uh, rockets that um, uh, the NASA uh, sends to uh, the space, um, they... Uh, utilize uh, thermoelectric generators a lot because there's a lot of heat generated uh, in those devices and why waste that heat why not uh, utilize heat that heat to uh, power uh, some electronics so in those applications in those applications uh, we actually uh, need uh, materials that can function uh, at their best at, at, at those very high uh, temperatures so you can see that uh, certain materials behave um, better uh, in, in certain temperature ranges. For instance, if we are mainly interested in uh, room temperature applications and body uh, variables um, actually are around room temperature, uh, 37 degrees Celsius is, is the body temperature, if you recall, um, so we need a thermoelectric device that operates well around... Um, uh, 50 degrees Celsius. And you can see that there's really only one material that does well, and that is uh, bismuth uh, antimony uh, telluride, or bismuth telluride is also one of those materials. And it does go through a peak, so there is an optimum uh, temperature uh, for this material. If I'm interested in um, uh, higher temperature applications, uh, you can see that uh, lead telluride or lead antimony telluride um, is a good material. And even uh, higher temperatures, silicon germanium um, happens to be um, a good material. All right. So this plot basically shows um, the figure of merit for these materials. But there's another thing that's very interesting in this plot. And um, so let me clean my plot um, so that I can easily show what I'm talking about. Um, let's look at, uh, for instance, <coughs> um, this one right here. It says nano p-type uh, silicon germanium. And this is p-type silicon germanium. <coughs> <coughs> so, um, as you can see, if there is some nano property here, and that's that can come in different flavors, as we shall see. The material ZT is actually improved. So from a smaller number, 
uh, in this case, on the order of 0 0.3, 0 0.4, um, the ZT is improved in this, at this temperature to something like 0 0.6, 0 0.7, okay? And then, of course, at a higher temperature, like 800 degrees, the improvement is even more, okay? And, and similar is true for n-type silicon germanium, and that's, those are the two green lines uh, from the dashed green line, this is a regular silicon germanium, to nano n-type silicon germanium, I have this nice improvement. Similar uh, improvement can be obtained uh, at uh, around room temperature for bismuth telluride as well. For instance, uh, the work done at NCSU by Dr. Uh, Dariush Vashai uh, produces um, um, ZT figure of merits uh, on the order of 1.5, and this is a nanostructured uh, bismuth uh, antimony telluride. And you can see that there's a nice jump uh, in uh, figure of merit from 1 to uh, more than 1.5 uh, using that. So how do we do this uh, nanostructuring? It, it comes really in uh, different uh, flavors. So one of those uh, techniques is actually, instead of using uh, a bulk semiconductor, uh, we use uh, nanowires of the same material. And, and in this example, uh, we have silicon nanowires. So Silicon actually is a very bad thermoelectric material because silicon is a very conductive uh, material, thermally conductive material. And, um, and it just doesn't work. Uh, it, it can have a good Seebeck coefficient. It can have very low electrical uh, resistivity, but its thermal conductivity is very high. So it just doesn't work as a good um, thermoelectric material. But people uh, have Berkeley uh, shown um, that the thermal conductivity of uh, silicon can be dropped significantly if um, we form uh, silicon nanowires. And uh, here, um, um, the, the bulk one is not uh, shown, but already um, when we have the uh, uh, nanowires formed uh, with a diameter of 115 uh, nan nanometers, uh, we have um, a factor of five or so drop uh, in the thermal conductivity of the material. And the thermal conductivity continues to drop as we decrease the diameter of the nanowires. Now we have a second set here actually um, showing the same uh, nanowire uh, diameters. The difference between um, uh, these uh, two sets is that these nanowires are much rougher. In other words, that the, sur uh, the surfaces of these nanowires are rougher. So it basically shows that, tells us that the uh, if we shrink the physical dimensions um, um, of the uh, uh, semiconductor uh, in which we have the heat flow, somehow the, um, uh, the, the thermal conductivity drops. And, and things get even uh, uh, better um, if, if the surface um, uh, of these uh, nanowires or surface morphology is, is poor. So we have a rough uh, surface. And um, so because this is a semiconductor and because the, the thermal conductivity is determined by uh, phonons uh, and electrons, the idea is that, um, the claim is that the phonon transfer can be significantly reduced by um, uh, uh, forming these nanowires. Essentially, um, phonon uh, transfer, if you, if you uh, imagine phonons as, uh, like photo, photons, uh, particles uh, traveling uh, in the material, by, by shrinking the dimensions, you have basically uh, created a, a, the, a situation in which these phonons are actually um, getting into collisions uh, with the sidewalls. I think that's a nice way of um, uh, viewing um, um, this, uh, this picture. So you have the zigzag motion of the phonons. Uh, if you view them as particles, um, they are lattice waves, obviously. Um, but um, I think the particle uh, analogy uh, gives you a good uh, way of uh, thinking about this. So that's, that's one way. 
the um, the other uh, technique is to form super lattices. So we've seen super lattices before. These are very thin um, semiconductor layers, and we have seen that if we go from one material to another at these interfaces, um, phonons have some barriers, and 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 phonons have to go through these barriers without any attenuation if the thermal conductivity is not going to be affected. Well, the reality is that at each um, semiconductor to semiconductor interface, um, we do have a phonon uh, barrier, and phonon motion is actually uh, affected. And, and you, can, you can imagine uh, why this is happening, because you have these um, atoms of the, of the super lattice uh, connected to each other, and 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 each interface is a disturbance, and and so and that's a problem uh, for 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 the lattice wave to have a nice spread uh, uh, over the entire material. So you have an interruption at every interface. You have a dis disturbance at every interface, which eventually affects um, the um, uh, phonon transfer and the thermal conductivity uh, of the material. So this, this plot basically um, uh, shows the thermal conductivity measured as a function of temperature, but the difference uh, between these curves is, is basically um, about the um, uh, period uh, of these super lattices. So, um, and by period, I'm referring to the thickness of individual layers. So in this case, for instance, um, the, um, the largest one is 300 angstroms, and, and the smallest one is 445 angstroms. So as you decrease the thickness of these semiconductor layers, the thermal conductivity uh, drops. So in this case, the uh, example is given for silicon germanium, uh, silicon um, uh, super lattices. Silicon germanium itself has a low thermal conductivity as well, and that's related to alloy scattering, uh, when you have the mixture of silicon and germanium, naturally this, uh, the thermal conductivity drops. But um, by um, using the silicon germanium silicon super lattice, um, not only the thermal conductivity drops, as it turns out, you have additional advantages such as improved um, uh, Seebeck uh, coefficient uh, as well. Um, so I'd like to uh, show you what Dr. Vashai is doing at NC State. Um, he is using yet another technique called um, um, the uh, nanocomposite technique. And in this case, uh, what he has is um, these uh, uh, grains of these nanocrystals of this um, bismuth uh, antimony telluride. Uh, actually, um, selenium is also uh, in that. Uh, so you have these um, uh, crystalline uh, grains uh, fused together to create a bulk uh, material. And when you do that, you have these nano grains, but between the grains, you have these grain boundaries. And these grain boundaries also uh, um, serve as phonon barriers. They, they impede uh, the phonon motion and uh, consequently, the thermal um, conductivity is reduced. Fortunately, the electrical conductivity is not uh, killed uh, by these uh, grain boundaries as much. It will be affected, but the idea is, can we do this? Can we uh, introduce these grain boundaries uh, to reduce the thermal conductivity significantly without affecting the electrical conductivity as much? And as it turns out, that this is actually uh, very successful. Also, uh, as shown here, not only the thermal conductivity um, is affected, but also the Seebeck coefficient. So this becomes an optimization problem uh, for <clears throat> um, the application at hand. And, and this is just a random um, um, picture of, uh, from an experiment in which uh, many samples are prepared and by changing the properties of these um, semiconducting nanocomposites, uh, the thermal conductivity can be varied. So we have a large variation in thermal conductivity uh, going from something like 1 watt per meter Kelvin all the way to 0.2 watts per 
point, uh, 0.2 watt per meter Kelvin, which is actually a very, very low thermal conductivity. Just to give you an idea, um, the uh, plastics, um, they're uh, like polyamide or uh, PDMS, and they have thermal conductivity values uh, on the order of uh, 0 0.15, uh, 0 0.2. Uh, so uh, when you have a semiconductor material with a thermal conductivity of uh, 0 0.2, basically what you're saying is that my, my uh, semiconductor is behaving almost like a plastic. So it's really a thermal ins insulator, which is great. But at the same time, your thermal conductivity, so uh, Seebeck coefficient is also uh, changing. So, I mean, you don't want to lose your uh, Seebeck coefficient either. You know, you can see that uh, your thermal, the lowest thermal conductivity is also giving you the lowest uh, Seebeck coefficient, which is pretty bad. You, you, don't, you don't want that. So it's an optimization problem. Uh, for a particular application, your Seebeck coefficient may not be as important as the thermal conductivity of the material, so it may be just fine to use to use that condition. And uh, so, uh, of course, because all of these uh, uh, properties are changing, uh, the figure of merit is also changing, and 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 we see that here again different experiment uh, the, the, the different values. Uh, if we just focus on the room temperature, you can see that, again, we have a huge variation in the Z2 of figure of merit. All good. I mean, they're all uh, above a 1, which is, which is great, all the way up to uh, 1.7, uh, which is, of course, excellent, excellent um, um, Z2 figure of merit. So this is work done at NC State uh, by uh, Dr. Uh, Dariush uh, Washai. Okay, um, so uh, this is just um, uh, another plot um, of what I've shown before. It just includes uh, some more uh, uh, materials, but the idea being here is that every material has an optimum uh, point uh, that gives you the highest uh, ZT value at a given temperature. And for room temperature applications, we are primarily interested in uh, bismuth telluride, but there are other materials uh, in between. All right. Um, finally, I'd like to say a few words. Um, this is my last slide about uh, thermoelectric cooling. As it turns out, actually, that these um, thermoelectric modules, um, exact same modules that we use for um, generation of electricity, can be used for uh, cooling. And in this case, uh, uh, this is a, a plot uh, from your book. Um, the uh, uh, device actually has an applied uh, uh, voltage. So we, we are applying, we are connecting a voltage source to pass electrical current, uh, to force electrical current uh, through this device. So we do have this current uh, flow, okay? So it's not zero. But because of this uh, electric uh, current, we are able to do something very interesting. And, and this um, um, figure basically focusing on just one of these legs. As you can see, we have the semiconductor material sandwiched between two uh, metal uh, contacts. And in the real device, again, we have exactly the same thing. Uh, a P-type uh, or N-type uh, leg um, is sandwiched between two metal layers. So looking at the energy band diagram um, of this uh, sandwich uh, structure, um, we have to look at um, um, the uh, uh, thermal levels and uh, line up the uh, thermal levels and, and uh, compare uh, the relative uh, um, energies of um, the conduction band um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, in the metal and as well as in the semiconductor. All right, so suppose, suppose um, you have some hot electrons um, here, okay? Now these hot electrons are forced by the uh, electric current so that they actually enter uh, the semiconductor. All right. Now, there is a potential barrier between the conduction band 
uh, of the metal and the conduction band of the semiconductor. So only those electrons that have the sufficient energy to uh, jump this barrier will be able to go uh, to uh, the semiconductor. So what we're really saying is that we have some hot electrons and these uh, electrons um, have some random distribution of, of energy. Some are hot, some are not very hot. Only those hot electrons will have the energy to go into the conduction band of the semiconductor. <coughs> but these, these um, uh, electrons are not just sitting there. They are actually flowing to form an electric current. So they are flowing from left to right. So when they, when they leave the conduction band of the uh, semiconductor, now uh, they jump into the conduction band of the metal, which is sitting at a lower uh, energy uh, value. So they don't need to <coughs> retain that excess energy. They, they can give up that excess energy as heat and um, reside uh, lower energy levels in the conduction band. So overall, what's happening is that <coughs> because of this um, potential barrier between the conduction band in the metal and the conduction band in the semiconductor, we are only allowing the hot electrons to enter the semiconductor. <coughs> and in a way, we are, by picking uh, the hot electrons that reside in the metal, we are taking some energy in the form of heat from the metal, right? Because we are only accepting the hot electrons into the conduction band, with each hot electron transferring from the conduction band of the metal into the conduction band of the semiconductor, we are taking some heat away from the metal. We are simply taking that heat from the metal and putting that in the semiconductor by each electron. And then when the electron makes a transition from the conduction band of the semiconductor into the conduction band of the metal, well, it doesn't have to retain that heat, that excess energy, and it's just uh, given, given up. So we are therefore absorbing heat from this side and then giving the heat on the other side. So this way, we are able to use the lateral motion of the electrons to absorb heat from one side and dump heat on the other side. This uh, is the principle uh, of cooling um, uh, used by um, electronic refrigerators. Okay, so this concludes uh, our discussion on uh, thermoelectric uh, uh, generators and cooling, which is a very neat application of nanotechnology. Um, I should say that um, the thermoelectric uh, industry was um, stagnant for many, many years um, until about 10 years ago, um, researchers at different research labs uh, came up with the idea that if we nanostructure the material, the properties of the thermoelectric uh, devices can be improved uh, significantly because the ZT fi uh, figure of merit is improved, um, and, um, and and devices can um, can can benefit from a much uh, better material. But I have to also say that um, it's not just the ZT figure of merit but the device uh, properties uh, must also be improved, and that includes the contact resistances and the heat sinks. So this is a complex uh, thermal problem. We have to look at it as a whole system to, to uh, obtain the best efficiency possible for cooling or um, uh, thermoelectric uh, power generation. That is great, um, but um, there are other factors that, that impact uh, the performance um, of, of a TEG. So we can improve um, the uh, material properties, but the, uh, the system design also uh, does uh, make a big difference. 
Uh, in this case, uh, in these plots, um, we are trying to show you uh, the impact of the application. And, uh, and the specific example given here um, is, again, harvesting um, heat um, from, the, from the human body. So this plot, the first plot, uh, shows you uh, the maximum power uh, generated uh, by uh, a thermoelectric generator in microwatts. And um, um, we compare uh, materials with different uh, ZT figure of merits. And, and, and this, the range that we consider includes um, ZTs starting from ZT of 0.8, and that's the ZT of commercial uh, thermoelectric materials, uh, all the way up to um, excellent, excellent materials with ZT of 1.5, okay? So each bar here corresponds to a, a different ZT figure of merit. And, and, and these, we have four groups, and the difference between four groups is um, uh, essentially uh, parasitic resistances. The first one, is um, the labeled walking and best skin. So what we mean by that is, well, when you walk, as we've uh, discussed before, uh, we generate some um, forced convection because we, we move um, uh, the uh, thermoelectric device. And as we move the thermoelectric device, that results in some uh, air velocity uh, with respect to the thermoelectric device. And that results in forced convection, and that results in more efficient rejection of heat uh, from the cold side. And we have the best skin. And, and so best uh, skin resistance or the lowest skin resistance uh, is there because on the body, uh, the skin resistance is not going to be uniform. There will be uh, regions where you have um, a rougher um, skin uh, surface, therefore the contact resistance is going to uh, go up. So typically, when people look at the resistance of the skin, uh, they give that in a range, and we want to look at um, a range of uh, skin resistances here. So the first one is walking and best skin. The next one is stationary. So we essentially killed the forced convection. We are entirely relying on natural convection from the TEG, but our skin resistance is still uh, very good. And you can see that for every, for every ZT, um, this performance drops. Okay? And in fact, that drop is not negligible, quite a bit of drop. Uh, the TEG uh, delivering about 400 microwatts, uh, this is the one with a ZT of 1.5, um, actually goes down to 150 microwatts or so. So more than um, uh, half of uh, that uh, uh, initial power is lost to uh, convection. Now, if we um, uh, now look at uh, walking, again, forced convection, but look at a worst skin case. So this is now a very large skin resistance things can get really, really bad. So it is really important to uh, uh, place your device uh, on a uh, good um, uh, part of the body that, that minimizes skin resistance. The last one is the hopeless case. Uh, not only we don't have any forced convection because it's stationary, but also the skin resistance is very large. But in both cases, we really are referring to uh, the parasitic uh, resistances. In the case of the skin resistance, we are referring to the contact resistance between the, between the skin and the device. In the case of walking versus stationary, we are referring to the parasitic resistance of the heat sink uh, determined by uh, the heat transfer coefficient um, of the device. As we have seen before, the heat transfer coefficient uh, will be determined by um, the uh, air velocity, uh, it will be determined by the thermal conductivity uh, of the material. So um, the other, th but there may be some th tricks that we can play. For instance, uh, in the right uh, plot, um, we have our TEG, but we have uh, some conducting uh, area uh, around it. That basically means that I, I'm able to collect heat from a larger area 
and 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 that uh, external um, heat spreader uh, can transfer the heat laterally uh, to the TG. So you can play tricks like this to increase um, uh, the area for heat collection and and reduce um, the the overall uh, impact uh, of the skin uh, resistance. And and um, this plot basically shows that. Um, using uh, a spreader like this, we can have a substantial uh, improvement uh, in the output power, which is basically shown uh, here. Okay, so um, the system design, uh, the moral of the story is that uh, the ZT is important, but actually uh, these uh, external uh, parasitics can be quite significant, um, as it's obvious from the plot on the left, um, the uh, ZT, yes, uh, it is helping. Uh, as we improve the ZT, uh, the maximum power is increasing, but uh, the impact of these parasitic resistance is so much that um, uh, a significant drop is experienced uh, by not um, optimizing our device um, uh, for um, the, the application that we have in hand. So it is important to look at uh, both uh, the material properties as well as um, the, the system design.